So there's really two remaining points to be made about John Stuart Mill's On Liberty. Uh, the first are the major arguments for personal freedom, and the second is a set of concerns he has about the power of a centralized state. So remember, the fundamental tension in Mills on Liberty is between, on the one hand, his strong endorsement of this nearly absolute principle of personal liberty constrained only by the need to protect others from harm, and on the other hand is the principle of utility. And it seems at first glance as if sometimes the best way of promoting the general welfare will be by restricting individual liberty. So Mill's trying to explain why that appearance is misleading. He has two main arguments for uh, the importance of liberty. The first is that individuality is an essential element of well-being and liberty protects, fosters individuality. So part of the task is to understand what does Mill mean by individuality. So Mill tells us human nature is not a machine to be built after a model and set to do exactly the work prescribed for it. Rather it's a tree which requires to grow and develop itself on all sides according to the tendency of the inward forces which make it a living thing. And again in another place Mill says Individuality is the same thing with development, and it is only the cultivation of individuality which produces or can produce well-developed human beings. So one thing we can say about the big picture here is that this is a broadly romantic picture of human beings. Of everyone we've read, the person that Mill actually sounds the most like is, surprisingly, Herder. However, they apply it at different scales. Herder's main focus is on the, uh, the individuality, the authenticity of a particular nation. And so each nation has to be true to itself. Each nation has to uh, avoid attempting to imitate other nations. So Germany has to be Germany. Germany can't try to be uh, France. Mill is using a very similar kind of argument, but he's applying it at an individual level. He says it's important for each individual to become who they really are and to avoid either attempting to imitate others or, what's worse, um, being forced to imitate others, being forced uh, to conform to certain uh, conventions about what's the proper way of living a human life. So that's the big picture, is this romantic idea of individual development, that each person needs to be true to who they really are. Uh, it's important to have social conditions that avoid forcing people to conform. Now, when you try to break this down more carefully about exactly what does individuality mean for Mill, that becomes a bit more difficult, something that scholars of Mill uh, have different views about, but I think what we can do is at least underline three different aspects of this picture of individuality for Mill. Uh, that'll give us a better grasp of the kind of thing that Mill has in mind. So one thing I think Mill thinks about individuality, recall we just read this uh, sentence a moment ago where he says individuality is the same thing with development. One idea that Mill has is that a person only really develops his own intellectual powers by leading his own life, by being in charge of his life, by m making his own decisions. This resembles Mill's argument, or one of Mill's arguments, about the importance of freedom of expression, that the only way that you can hold opinions in a responsible adult way is by being confronted with arguments on the other side. So similarly, Mill thinks the only way that you can really develop your powers as a human being is by having the freedom to make decisions in life and having the freedom to make even the wrong decisions. So you need the opportunity to make decisions to develop your potential to become um, a more developed human being. Interestingly then, Mill's view 
actually does resemble Aristotle's in some way. Uh, you could describe Mill as holding a view of indirect perfectionism. And what I mean by that is Mill doesn't think that the, the proper role of the state is to uh, carefully guide each person, certainly once they become adults, into becoming virtuous human beings. But it is a proper concern of the state to create social conditions that enable people to develop their potential, to realize their, uh, their capacities. And the most important thing that the state can do in that respect, according to Mill, is to uh, protect individual liberty. By protecting individual liberty, uh, individuals are going to have the opportunity to, to develop their powers to, this isn't Mill's way of talking, but to become more virtuous, more perfect human beings. A second part of this ideal of individuality, I think, is that Mill stresses that individuals are different. There's different kinds of characters out there. And so he says, to give any fair play to the nature of each, it is essential that different persons should be allowed to lead different lives. Um, one major mistake, Mill thinks, in the history of human societies is the idea that everyone's alike and that everyone ought to be leading the same kind of life, ought to be uh, pursuing the same kinds of values, same kinds of activities in life. No, Mill says it, there's lots of different kinds of character and it's important that there's freedom so each person can figure out what really suits them best. A third element of Mill's idea of individuality is what I would call authenticity. So Mill uh, tells us that if a person possesses any tolerable amount of common sense and experience, his own mode of laying out his existence is the best. Not because it is the best in itself, but because it is his own mode. Again, he says, a person whose desires and impulses are his own are the expression of his nature as it has been developed and modified by his, by his own culture. That person is really said to have character. So Mill thinks there's a, you might call this a kind of adverbial side of leading a good life. It's important that you do the right things, but it's also important that you do the right things in the right way. And that is that you do things in your own way. And that that kind of life is better for people, even when people make mistakes, even when people don't pursue the best form of life for themselves. If it's nonetheless was their choice, then that's still that's ultimately important, and um, it's it's better that people lead lives according to their own lights of what's best than they actually necessarily make the best decisions in each circumstance. So those are some of the things that Mill means by individuality, and his fundamental idea is that individuality is an essential element of well-being. What it means to lead a good life as the kind of being we are, that is a progressive being, is to develop one's own individual potential, one's own individual character in one's own way. So what can the state do to make that more likely? Well, they can't force you to become a certain kind of individual. That would defeat the whole point of individuality. What the state can do is protect individual liberty. And so this is why Mill thinks that protection of individual liberty actually does tend to work out to promote everyone's interest in the long run because it protects this fundamental interest we have, the interest in individuality. Mill's other main argument for personal liberty is essentially an application of the kind of argument he used to defend freedom of speech, freedom of expression. So this is his idea of experiments in living. So he tells us that mankind are not infallible, their truths for the most part are only half-truths, unity of opinion unless resulting from the fullest, and freest comparison of opposite opinions is not desirable, diversity is not an evil, but a good. So. As it is useful that while mankind are imperfect, there should be different opinions, 
So it is that there should be different experiments in living, that free scope should be given to varieties of character short of injury to others, and that the worth of different modes of life should be proved practically when anyone thinks fit to try them. So just as it's important to have different opinions about religious matters, about proper relation between the sexes and so forth, it's also important that people apply those different ideas in life, that people strike out on with new experiments in living. And maybe some ways of trying to live aren't going to work out very well, but the rest of humanity is not going to know what forms of life are really valuable, what can really what kinds of life can human beings really flourish in if some people aren't out there experimenting? So again, this is just an argument that's in parallel with the argument for the freedom of expression. Just as it's important that there's a diversity of opinions, it's important that there's a diversity of people trying out different ways of life. Some will work, some won't, but we're all better off for there being this diversity of experiments in living. The final topic that Mill addresses in On Liberty is the question of how active should the state be in trying to solve people's problems. So as he notes, this is a bit of a different subject. It's not primarily about limitation of individual liberty. It's about how many of the problems of society should the state take on its own shoulders, as opposed to letting individuals sort things out for themselves. Basically, Mill is skeptical of a state that is too active. He thinks the burden of proof is always on those who want the state to do something. And he thinks there are a number of reasons why government activity is problematic. So first, he just thinks as a general matter, things are done better by private individuals in most cases than by government officials. That's his general presumption. In cases where that's not true, he thinks that needs to be shown, that the government is going to do it better than private individuals. Second, even when private individuals aren't best at performing certain tasks, it's often nonetheless desirable that they do perform those tasks as a means, as he puts it, to their own mental education. That is, it's, it's good for people to solve their own problems, even if the government could do it more efficiently. So a kind of analogy here is the way that parents might react, might interact with their children. So sometimes, a lot of the times, parents can do something more efficiently for their children than their children can do for themselves. But many enlightened parents think it's nonetheless important to let their children nonetheless do it in their own way because it's good for their education, it's good for their development. So this leads Mill to his third point, that government interference, government activity tends to add to the government's power, and in the long run what this does is it stunts individual initiative and development. So the more things that the state does, the more that individuals just assume that someone else is going to take care of their problems for them. People are just going to assume that the government is going to uh, solve its problems, and so they won't apply themselves to solving those problems themselves. And that stunts individual development. So Mill's conclusion is this. He says, the worth of a state in the long run is the worth of the individuals composing it. A state which dwarfs its men in order that they may become more docile instruments in its hands, even for beneficial purposes, will find that with small men, no great thing can really be accomplished. So there's this inherent tension between a powerful state and active, uh, great individuals in Mill's picture. One contrast then to draw with Mill is Rousseau. Not that Rousseau wants men to be dwarfed, but recall Rousseau does think that people should be highly reliant on the community and not very reliant on one another. That is, he, he's suspicious of dependence that exists between private individuals. He wants most dependence to exist between the individual and the state. So Mill offers a kind of classical liberal counterweight to that view, that no, it's, it's actually bad for individuals to depend or to rely on the state too much. Mill's basic picture is that
you want to disseminate power. You want to decentralize power in society. You don't want the state to hold all the power. What the state can best do is centralize information and then diffuse information so that everyone else can use that information in the most productive way. So that covers what I want to say about John Stuart Mill. Some of the main ideas to keep in mind then, the way he adheres both to the principle of utility, but also defends this strong right of individual liberty. So a lot of the interest in Mills on liberty is the way that he tries to argue for liberty on broadly utilitarian grounds. In particular, the way that he argues that freedom of speech, freedom of expression, tends to promote truth and uh, more justified opinions in the long run. The way that freedom of uh, individual conduct tends to foster conditions for the development of individuality and also create space for experiments in living so that we can find out new and better ways to lead our lives. And finally, you have his suspicion of centralized power. The importance, as he sees it, that individuals remain active in solving their own problems and not become too reliant on a government bureaucracy.